this is very strong coffee I can do you have a hangover or something no it's not a hangover I was up all night watching the last season of the crown on Netflix you and the rest of the world hi everyone this is Nazla Nertan and my sleepy friend here is Aigen Aytaç we will be discussing the crown on Netflix as we are totally incapable of talking of anything else she is the oxygen we all breathe the essence of all our duty. Your problem, if I may say, is you seem to be confused about who that person is. Oh, yes, there are so many to discuss about The Crown, the series on the current history of the British royals. Its fourth season is on Netflix now. And it is even more interesting than the previous ones, because it talks about Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Everybody is talking about them again. The fact that COVID-19 lockdowns made us all glued to the screens again also had a role in the revived discussions. We would also like to join in. But which part are we going to join in, Nazlan? Shall we discuss from the point of cinematography? Is it a great series or is it fake news? I think even the fact that we are talking about what we should discuss is a is the strength of this drama. You know, in the last two weeks, I have watched two series on Netflix. One was the strictly Turkish Bir Başkadır Etos, and the other was strictly British but nevertheless international The Crown. I think the success of both was that they could be read on so many levels. They were, of course, a reflection of the social, even socioeconomic structure of the country, some sort of historical testimony. But at the same time, we know that both were fiction. Now, I find it slightly ridiculous that everybody, including British cabinet ministers and actresses, say that the Crown should come with the warning that it's not a documentary, but it's a fiction. Of course! A series is a series. But then when we look at ethos, which is also very much discussed all over the media, those people do not exist. They are totally fictional people. Of course. But yeah. the people we see in the last season of The Crown are still living. They are alive. Except for Diana. <laughs> yes, except for Diana. And even that hurts me, you know. Is it a good depiction of Diana? Like, I feel responsible personally whether they are picturing her rightly because she doesn't have a say in this and indeed just because these people are living they may have a say in this and they may even call it fake you know because they are still living you are right ethos in that sense is pure fiction they are a description of some stereotypes which represent certain people Khan is actually talking about real people and real people that whose stories we have read in the news, mm -hmm. including Diana's. So we already have certain opinions on that. Remember, there was this huge debate in the UK at one moment. Are you a Diana fan or are you a Camilla fan? Yeah, there was. Whom should Charles choose? Was he stupid to take a mistress older than his wife? Because mistresses are supposed to be younger and prettier <laughs> compared to the actual wife. And there was also this pity for Charles. Oh, poor Charles, couldn't yeah. get his true love. Exactly. It's a huge debate. Was the queen a good mother? Is there really a love story between Elizabeth and Philip? And what also Margaret. Is Philip? Margaret. Our mothers also knew the tragedy of Margaret. Exactly. Tragedies. The sad princess. <laughs> yeah, the series actually, and there it's similar with Ethos, the series allowed us to float our prejudices or rethink them. And it's a good watch. Yeah, it's a if good you, watch. If you watch it as a fiction TV series, it's beautiful. The characters are beautiful. They are beautifully presented. The the images are wonderful. wonderful. I just love the nature, the nature and shots. Yes, and the, some concepts they touch on what's the meaning of life, family vis-a-vis -vis bureaucracy or state. National. Or could you have a favorite child? Yes. Which yes. I think was a very relevant subject. They, they're very, very deep subjects. And I was really affected by some of the things uh, mentioned there, you know. The thing is, you Broca. have lived in London, mm -hmm. so you were closer to the Queen than <laughs> me. Yes, I've even been to one of her five o'clock teas <laughs> in the Buckingham <laughs> Palace garden tea party. Did you talk to her? No, of course, as it was also stressed in the series, actually, even the people 
who will talk to the queen are or already Prince Char Charles are already identified notified. beforehand. But uh, in that tea party, which I've attended while I was working at the BBC, there Prince Charles came very close to me. And of course, he talked to the formerly nom nominated people, a few mm -hmm. people in front of me. But yeah, I had the first row, I, c I could say. <laughs> Um, but going back to the crown, you lived in London and of course the royal family made very much the part of the coverage. Yes. And I'm sure you have formed certain opinions regarding the That's royal true. family and its members. Did this change after you watched the crown? Uh, no. At one point while watching the crown, I thought it could have been written or edited or approved by the queen herself. Because Queen, in my opinion, is shown as the protector of the royalty and at the expense of her family and relations. Even like uh, she is shown as against the apartheid reg regime in South Africa in the la last season. So Queen is like the Queen, uh, depicted like the Queen of our hearts in that series, in my opinion. Despite all the other facts, like she doesn't have good relations with her family members and kind of wasting all of mm -hmm. them. I don't think she wrote it. I'm not sure she even watched it because nobody confirms whether she, she... certainly will not admit watching it. Yes, yes. But how I see the situation is like the following. British people are so protective of their queen, of their royal family, most of them, they are more pro-queen than the queen herself. I know this because you remember there was a hoax, telephone hoax in 90s. A radio man from Canada, a comedian, called the Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace? Yes, this is Jacques Chrétien, Prime Minister of Canada. Hello, sir. Hello. I'm just trying to connect you to Her Majesty now. Thank you. Hello? Oui, hello? Oh. Prime Minister. Good evening, Majesty. Hello. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Vous allez bien? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Please accept my deepest respect. Thank you very much. He and, uh, pretended that he was the Canadian the Prime Minister and he managed to get the Queen on the phone. And on his live radio program, he fooled her and he asked her to support him. In one I have no recollection of that. Go on. No, That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, that is. But even though Palace didn't have any special request on that, BBC refused to broadcast it. I agree that the British press and the people are extremely protective of their Queen. But going back to the Queen's personality in the Crown, I'm going to challenge you there. For challenge me. me. <laughs> <laughs> because I think the Queen is seen not in a particularly positive light. We see her as a self-sacrificing woman, a woman very much aware of her duty to the Crown. Mm -hmm. but she comes across as a bad mother who alternates between ignoring the emotional needs of her children and allowing them to act completely entitled. Her only soft spot mm -hmm. is toward the two rather unpleasant members Dogs. of the family. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, in terms of humans. Yes, her only support seems to be towards the rather two unpleasant members of the family. Philip, who's a very cool man at times and very bitter, and to Andrew, whom the history has revealed as a true pervert after the Epstein story. We don't even see her as a particularly good sovereign because I think in the British history, one of the main tasks of the present sovereign is to prepare the next sovereign. And the Queen seems to largely ignore her role in that, which has led the British crown to the current place that it finds itself in, meaning the Queen has to go on forever because Charles would be a very risky choice. Obviously, they are dragging him in the mud. Charles is the worst depicted person, in my opinion, in the series. But you may have a point, actually. The reason I thought it was very much pro-Queen, this series, because despite all the family tragedies, somehow they said, ah, oh, Queen did all this for her country, for the continuation of the royalty. But then in the last season, there came Diana and she was presented as a very good human being. So that's why in a way there the audience sees there's another way to be popular 
and looking at her Australia visit. So it doesn't have to be like that, very strict like Elizabeth was. So in a way you are right, maybe Queen didn't approve this. <laughs> No, what I think is the series is so complexly built, it allowed us to read it in many different ways in light of our prejudices. When I watched the series, I thought Diana was terribly immature, terribly needy, but that, and, that and made, slightly stupid. But that made her very human, no? I think people like human figures rather I than think, robotic figures. I think many men who admire Diana from a distance would hate to be married to such a needy woman. But who cares about what men think? Uh, <laughs> I think as a woman I would hate to have somebody as needy as Diana as my best friend. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan of Anne after the series. Mm -hmm. And actually the Vanity Fair has written that Princess Anne's popularity ratings has skyrocketed because she came as funny, ironic, no-nonsense, intelligent, intelligent Almost and like you, Nazla. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, uh, I adhere fully to her sexual morals, but perhaps not to her love of horses. <laughs> but yeah, I like Anne. It's true. I think many women would find it easier to identify with Anne than with Diana. Oh, I'm so sorry that I identify with Diana. Why? <laughs> Just this morning, I watched her hugging a child with AIDS and I loved it. I, I almost came to tears, you know. <laughs> God. We enjoy it. It's, be it's a beautiful it's, it's series. A, it's a but don't you think it was written by someone pro-monarchy and also pro-church? Oh, totally. In fact, I was amazed by the Christianity or the stress of Christianity in the series. We were discussing earlier if anything that has happened in the series changed our mind by watching it. And in my case, I was amazed by the role of the Anglican Church yes. in their lives. I was under the mistaken impression that somehow, ever since Henry VIII, the Church was not an important factor yeah. in the minds of the people on the throne. And apparently I was wrong. The Church was important to the Queen and it was also important to Philip. It was surprising for me too. In fact, the only person who was not religious was Charles. Charles was more interested in the dialogue between the religions than any particular religion in itself. That's true. And perhaps that's why he was not against the idea of divorce from early on. Definitely. And also, all the rest of the family uh, couldn't divorce due to religious rules, no? Exactly. Nor could they marry somebody who had been divorced. Do you think royal family members may feel they are being exploited and being uh, presented in a false, simplistic way just for those producers to make money? I mean, isn't it a bit unfair? I would have thought they would be used to it by now. I mean, Hollywood has been making money out of the royal family with the loves of Henry VIII, with Elizabeth. Diana I as well, no? There, Diana? Wasn't there a film? Yes, there was a film of Diana, and of course there was also the, the Queen, the famous film The Queen, where Helen Mirren played the Queen, yes. which I think was the most sympathetic sure. interpretation of Queen. I rather think that the, the British royal family must think it comes with the job. There would be movies and there would be series. They must have a very thick skin. Made about that. The thing is, why do we love the British royal family so much. I mean, if there was a series about the Dutch royal family, for example, I don't think we would be talking about it. I don't know about you, but I like British films and British series, actually. I think they are very professionally done, after Turkish series especially, where you, you cannot finish one series <laughs> in 90 minutes and all those looks and all those repetitions, repetitions. I think from a professional point of view, those films are very well told, very well cut, no repetitions, nobody tells nothing to anybody. We even didn't see the wedding party of Diana. Uh, no, we didn't see their marriage I, in I the Westminster Abbey, I think. Yeah, I, I loved it. We didn't lose time with those things. It's so intellectual, in my opinion, the way they put it. But it's not only Crown, but many other uh, yeah. British series. No, the Brits are very good with their series. It's just the right dose of irony, good images, 
Definitely. A good cinematography. Good quality. Good quality. And also intelligent dialogues. But go on, tell me, what's your favorite scene there? Ah, uh, my favorite scene was the one in which the fictionalized version of Philip had a midlife crisis. You know, he was a very worldly, very active adventurer, making fun of all the clergymen in the palace who were trying to find the meaning of life by talking to each other. This was the episode in which he was obsessed with the moon landing and the heroism of the astronauts who made the moonwalk. Remember, uh, he wanted to have a special meeting with them when they visited the palace and prepared lots of questions for them with excitement. But, but in the encounter with the moonwalking idols, he realized there are three normal guys from America. When Philip asked them how they felt when they were on the moon, They said, well, we were busy with technicalities. And one said he heard this sound bang, bang, bang while he was trying to rest. And they realized it was from the water cooler. After this trivial answer, Philip didn't ask any further questions. And to add insult to his injury, the astronauts in return asked, oh, how many rooms are there in this palace? How many steps, etc.? After this meeting, Philip went to the clergyman and apologized to them and confessed that he realized that if one didn't have faith, he would only find loneliness and emptiness rather than finding the divine creation, even if he went all the way to the moon. As I find anything about the meaning of life interesting, I remember the scene very well. But of course, this was presented in the episode as a prelude to a renewed interest in Philip's Christian faith. Yes, that was the taming of the shrew in reverse, wasn't it? With that, the fiery Philip was tamed for uh, palace life. Yeah, growing up. Becoming a husband. Yeah, I'm surprised Dalai Lama wasn't in this <laughs> story. <laughs> But what, what's your favorite scene? <laughs> Now I feel very self-conscious because after your existentialist scene, mine is rather shallow. It is the scene between Mrs. Thatcher and the Queen where Mrs. Thatcher is very distraught and she confesses to the Queen that she's distraught because her favorite child, her son, is lost during a rally in Africa. And the Queen is very amazed by this confession. She goes back to the palace and tells Philip, but She, she told me quite unashamedly that she has a favorite child. And Philip, with typical rudeness, goes, of course, everybody has a favorite child. Mine is Anne. What's yours? <laughs> And the queen says, do I have a favorite child? And Philip says, yes, of course, everybody knows it. So the queen, she's so unaware of herself as a mother that she goes around scheduling luncheons with each of her children to determine who is her favorite. Yeah. <laughs> does she have favorite? <laughs> Apparently she does, but for fear of giving spoilers, I'm not telling it. Oh, maybe she doesn't have any feelings for any of them. <laughs> that, that is generally the message, yes. Yes. I'm not surprised actually that she doesn't have a favorite, but what surprises me, none of them leaves the palace. Everybody criticizes all the children, each of them, also the sister Margaret and Philip for years in the former episodes. We all saw them frustrated, but none of them left. Why do you think that is? Is it conformity, a sense of duty? What? Probably a combination of both. But we have a new season coming and that might change. Oh, you mean... <laughs> ah, don't give spoilers. <laughs> you have already. <laughs> Actually, don't listen to this podcast if you haven't watched it already. We should add that in the beginning, huh? <laughs> Bye-bye. See you. Talk to you. <laughs>